Hi, I'm Miss Tyler, and welcome to Context for Kids, episode 39. Gosh, there's been a long time between episode 38 and 39 because I have been insanely busy getting our school year started, and, well, we're getting ready to move to Idaho, which I'm very excited about because we lived there 10 years. My kids were born when we were living in Idaho, and it was just my favorite place of all to live. Anyway, so we've been really busy, but I've been looking forward to getting back to y'all guys. And I hope that you're, if you've started school this year, I hope you're enjoying it. So, this week is Torah Portion Re'eh. And it is, I didn't put the book, look at that. Deuteronomy 11, 16 to 16, 17. You know what? I guess that's a really good solution to the fact that I so often make the mistake and put the wrong book down. So, what we've got, we're talking about debts and slavery this time because in Deuteronomy 15 that's what they talk about. They talk about a really really weird law that they had that you know we certainly couldn't do now but maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea. Let's give it a look. So oh by the way look see this is the first shirt that I'm wearing that is not actually a hand-me-down from my kids. It's Captain America. It says I want you to watch your language. So I love this shirt, so I just wanted you to notice it. All right, so, oh, goodness sakes. Turn it on. <laughs> Chapter 15, Deuteronomy, debts and slaves. Now, what did Yeshua tell us, well, tell his disciples in Matthew 26, 11 and Mark 14, 7? He said, the poor will always be with you. Well, that's kind of depressing. I mean, you know, we keep fighting these wars on poverty. Yeshua, Jesus, always, he, he said, he doesn't always say, he said that the poor would always be with us. Why? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Especially because in Deuteronomy 15.4, I know this looks like it's going to be, don't worry, everything in the Bible matches up. We just have to know where to look. And we have, sometimes we have to do my favorite thing, keep on reading some Deuteronomy. 15, 4, but there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord is giving you for an inheritance, inheritance to possess. He just says there will be no poor. Maybe we ought to keep reading. If only, if only you will strictly obey the voice of Adonai, your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I'm commanding you today. All right, so God was saying that if you do all these laws that show, that teach you how to love me and love your neighbors, there won't be any poor among you, but they weren't going to do it, and so there were always going to be poor among you. Like Yeshua said, there will always be poor among you. Why? Because people do terrible things to each other. Sometimes people are poor because of their own sins. Sometimes people are poor because of the sins of others. We don't always know the reason, and so we have to give honor to everybody. All right, we'll talk about that later. All right, so why were there poor in Israel? Are the righteous automatically rich and the unrighteous automatically poor? Well, wouldn't it be nice if you could just tell who was a terrible person? You know, oh, well, they're poor. They must be horrible. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Because sometimes unrighteous people are really, really rich, right? We've seen that. I mean, we could pretend like it isn't true, but it's true. Sometimes the mo most horrible people in the world have a lot of money. Sometimes the most wonderful people in the world have almost no money or no money at all. Because there's a lot more going on than just righteousness and unrighteousness. But what is righteousness and justice? Now, we've talked about this before. When we see the two words, righteousness and justice, together in Scripture, it meant something more than simply righteous, which means being declared right, or injustice, which means making sure that people are treated equitably according to the law. That's really not much of a different definition than we have now, with our modern legal systems. People want justice. If they're innocent, they want to be declared innocent. And if someone's guilty, they want them to be declared guilty. No one who's actually guilty wants to be declared guilty, right? 
If only. Okay, so the kings in the ancient world would practice something called righteousness and justice. When they would come and become a new king on the throne, they would be expected to do certain things if they were going to be called a righteous and just king. They would free all the slaves. They would um, release the political prisoners. They would release people from their debts. They would take care of the widow, orphan, oppressed, all that, and they would punish evildoers. Okay? This was often a one-time only thing at the beginning of the reign, but then they could say, I executed righteousness and justice, even if it was only once. You don't say that part in front of the king because he get Back then, that could be really dangerous. He'd get a little uppity and, yeah, doesn't pay to be honest around the king. All right, so what we find in scripture is slavery. Now, that's a weird thing, right, in a book about righteousness and loving God and loving your neighbors, that we actually find something like slavery. But slavery in the ancient world wasn't the way, I mean, we all think about roots. And that was horrible. That changed my life. When I was a kid and that came out in the 1970s, that changed a lot of people's lives. And the way a lot of people looked at the history of our country here in America. Okay? But in the ancient world, slavery was different and it was the same. All right? Now, what we're going to be talking about in Deuteronomy 15 is what is called the Israelite term of six years of slavery. Now, the Code of Hammurabi, we've talked about the Code of Hammurabi before. Code of Hammurabi was about the same time as Abraham was alive. And it allowed a man to be sold as a slave for three years to pay off his debts. But he was a slave. And there weren't, he wasn't protected the way that other people were protected under the laws of Hammurabi. As a matter of fact, if you look at the laws of Hammurabi and, and you look at the they had a case system as far as justice went. Like if you were a person who killed a rich man, you got a really horrible penalty. If you killed a slave, eh, you just have to reimburse the owner. No harm, no foul, right? Slave wasn't really a human anyway, right? Well, that's the way they looked at it. Okay, so it was good that there was a limit of three years that you could be sold to pay your debt, but you weren't protected under the law, okay? All right, now the United States law allows a person, a personal, <laughs> a person to declare bankruptcy in order to pay debts, but your credit rating is trashed, okay? And it leaves you really with a scar for a long, long time, all right? Plus, the people you owed money to, they don't get paid. So that's not very just, that's not very equitable, whereas with Hammurabi, the person would get paid because you were sold as a slave and that money would be given to the person you owed money to. All right, so not good solutions really. Now, Israelite slaves, if, it starts out the, the, the chapter, if so somebody falls into severe debt, and this was after, you know, it had other verses about, you know, if your brother needs a handout, you know, loan to him and just give him the money and don't worry if the time of canceling debts is because God's going to reimburse you because you were good to your brother. But if all that help that these guys are getting from their families isn't enough and they fall into deep enough debt, then they could sell themselves into slavery for six years to pay the debt. And of course their family would go with them. So, you know, we're not looking at a man leaving behind his family his wife and children, well, they would be with him. They would all be working as, as servants, but they'd be fed and they'd be cared for and they'd have a roof over their head. This wasn't like being homeless and this wasn't leaving a woman as though she was a widow with no support and children as though they were orphans because that would be the antithesis of Israelite law because God is always concerned with widows and the orphan and the poor and, and this was a great option for somebody who frankly couldn't even buy seed from his land and had probably already sold his land 
to somebody else and wouldn't be able to get it back until a jubilee year. All right? So, even though they were slaves, they were still considered to be brothers and sisters. They were protected by every single law that every other Israelite was protected by. So this wasn't slavery in the way that we would consider slavery. The women had to be treated with respect. Everybody had to be treated, treated with respect. And when the, um, when the time, when the six years were over, you know, they weren't dishonored. You know, they weren't still considered slaves. They were Israelites, okay? And they weren't sent away empty-handed. It actually says, when he goes out from you, be sure that you send him away with livestock and with food and, and with money in hand, things where he can start his life over again because he has worked so faithfully to you and has been better to you than a hired man, which is just somebody, you know, just an employee, okay? Now, they also had the opportunity, however, to remain a bond servant. And I'll explain why that's important. So say that you sold your ancestral land to another person. But it's a long, long time until the Shemitah, until the year of, or until, um, not the Shemitah, until the Jubilee, until your family's going to get the land back. And you'd be going out, but what would you be going out to? You don't have any land to farm. You have no way to make money for yourself. What you could do is you could say, I love my master and I want to remain with him. And so they would take you to the, uh, the doorpost and they would take an awl, which is a very, very sharp um, instrument that's either used to drill holes in wood or leather. And yeah, this is, and they put it against your ear and they bang it with a hammer and it would go through into the door. And that would mark you as a bond servant for life and you would be it but it still wasn't exactly slavery the way we would think of slavery because this person is now a trusted member of the household like Eliezer of Damascus with Abraham a bond servant somebody who's almost adopted into the family someone who can do business for the family that he can even he can wear the signet ring of the family to do business on behalf of the family because over the six years they have proven themselves to be trustworthy all right now in uh, in a, I almost said Akkadian law that's not right in the law of Hammurabi there is actually kind of the reverse situation instead of saying I love my master and I don't want to leave him say this man is not my master while he's still sold to him for you know the three years for his debt and and um, if he did that and it wasn't true that this guy wasn't his master if he'd been sold to, to pay off his debts, then the law of Hammurabi says if you wrongfully say that someone isn't your master, you don't get the three years of slavery. The guy gets to keep you for life. Although why he'd want you after all that is beyond me. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'll talk about non-Israelite slaves because there were non-Israelite slaves too. I want you to think of Bilha, Zilpa, and Hagar, Hagar especially. Um, Eliezer of Damascus, of course, that was before the time that the law was given at Sinai and the nation was formed. But you have, people would become slaves in different ways. I, it wasn't like we saw in Roots where, where um, especially in places like Nigeria, where clansmen from opposing tribes would go to war and they would um, they'd take all the POWs and they'd sell them to the people from Europe and South America and the Islamic countries and to um, America. Okay, they, uh, they wouldn't be dealing with, they were going to war in order to enslave people. Um, people just totally lost my train of thought. People were kidnapping other people for slavery. This was just an incredibly evil thing to do. Taking free people, kidnapping them. They didn't have any debts to pay off. Yeah, they weren't doing it to save these people's lives because one of the facts of war in the ancient world that's different from today is that there was no mercy. 
all right? And if you went and you conquered a people, and all the men were dead, and you've got all these women and children, if you leave them, they are going to starve. No one's sending in humanitarian aid. Another nation, if they find them at all, will come in and take them, and their lives would be horrific, because they would be subject to the slave laws of other nations that don't afford protection to slave, that say, you can damage a slave any way you want, and it's just tough on the slave. Israelite law says if you permanently damage a slave, that slave goes free for nothing. You know, if, if they put out an eye, you know, if, you know, chop off Kunta Kinte's foot, he would have gotten to go free. Um, women could not be treated the way that women, that female slaves have been treated, female African slaves have been treated all over the world. That wouldn't work. You can't do that according to the law. All right? Um, but so you've got prisoners of war who, if they're not taking into slavery, they're going to die. Or they're going to be taken into another nation where there are no protections afforded. I mean, this was, the ancient world was very brutal. War happened. Something had to be done with those women and children. Um, now, like I said, the slaves were protected under God's laws. Um, so we have POWs, prisoners of war, who were mostly women and children. Okay? And without being taken slaves, there was no other option. Um, and foreign poor. When you look at, like, Bilhan Zilpa, Bilhan Zilpa, the maidservants or the concubines of the forefather Jacob, they were never considered actually full wives, and they're never referred to as wives. They're always referred to as the handmaidens or the women of um, Jacob. They're not ever called wives. Like, Leah and Rachel are always called the wives. Zilha, Zilpa and Bilha are always called the maidservants or just the women. Um, they were probably sold to Laban by their fathers when they were very young because he couldn't provide a dowry for them. And so when he would die, they would be single women at the mercy of... You know, they would be unmarried women. They would be single. They, they would have no protections, and they might starve. And so sometimes selling your daughter as a slave was the only way to ensure her being fed and being clothed, being housed. It was a harsh world, and these laws were written in the midst of a harsh world. We'd like to pretend that everything was hunky-dory in the ancient Near East, but it was really, really very brutal. And God's laws were incredibly humane, and they were dealing with real-life dilemmas, real-life situations that we no longer have to deal with. And sometimes we take that for granted. So, anyway, that's the story about debts and slavery, and I hope that that made sense to you. Um, do we practice slavery in the modern world? No. No, we don't. Well, I mean, some people do, especially in Islamic nations. There are, uh, they take slaves still, especially women who are prisoners of war. They take as slaves and children, and, and it's brutal, brutal and horrible. But that kind of slavery is outlawed in God's laws, absolutely outlawed. It, he does not approve of that kind of slavery. So <sighs> that's it for this week. Um, tomorrow, I'm planning on getting my proof copy in the mail of Ten Commandments and the Covenants of Promise, Context for Kids, Volume 2. So hopefully I'll be showing that to you next week. And if it checks out, then I'll have it available for sale on Amazon.com this week. Very excited. So that's this week. And next week we're going to talk about the Sanhedrin. We're going to talk about the judges. What we're going to talk about is false accusations in the ancient world and how very serious they were. That's going to be really interesting for you, I hope. So, anyway, I love you. I'm praying for you. And I hope that you have a wonderful week studying the scriptures together. Bye-bye.